So if everybody's lying down, it means those ciliated cells are resting at minus 50 volts. And like I was saying, when we get up, they will jump to 180 volts. So you're going to be very mindful of that excitement in your body. But before we do that, I just want to tell you of the Sena women, my aunties in Tierra del Fuego, who very much knew of this energizing that goes on in the body, but understood that it doesn't just happen inside the human body, but it happens outside the human body as well. And in waves and currents and sometimes in tsunamis, it happens as the body moves and also pushes the air and the liquids and changes the voltage of all of those substances, all of those elements. And so what they would do is that when their community needed some food, they were lacking, they couldn't find it, it was cold. One of them would go out to a point, a rocky point, and begin to sing. for the community. Of course, they were very aware that this was something tremendous to ask another creature to give its body, give its meat, give its fat, give its blood, give its life, surrender its motherhood or fatherhood for the good of this community. So there were lots of laws and restrictions and um, sense abilities of when and how to call the whale into the shore. And that was all electrical and mechanical and done through chant and a sense of belonging and balance of the humans in and on and of this planet. So let's tune in to that balance that sits right under the cerebellum in the middle of your head and energize it as you get up. And as you do, you're going to hear other voices and those other voices are going to lead you to another space. So 
So I invite you all to find a place around the room. Make yourself comfortable for about seven or eight minutes. We'll be here. You sit or stand. And I'll tell you another, another part of the story. Perhaps you can still feel that in your ear and fluid, keeping you balanced as you find your place. So my name is Astrida. Thank you to Uncle Bill for welcoming us here. I come from a place now called Sydney, in the Cooks River and the Pacific Ocean, but some waters that grew me up are the Great Lakes of Canada and the Baltic Sea of Europe. And now I want to tell a story that's part of those waters as well. And the first part is just called Bodies of Water. <clears throat> a small ocean swallowed, a wild wetland in your gut, rivulets forsaken making their way from inside to out, from watery womb to watery world. You are a body of water. As bodies of water, we leak and see our borders always vulnerable to rupture and renegotiation. Our wet matters are in a constant process of intake, transformation, exchange, drinking, peeing, sweating, sponging, weeping. The bodies of water from which we siphon and into which we pour ourselves are certainly other human bodies, but they are just as likely a sea a cistern, an underground reservoir of once was rain. Our wateriness reminds us that the human is always more than human, co-constituted by other wet bodies and habitats of all kinds. As Virginia Woolf once wrote, there are tides in the body. This is to say, water extends our bodies in time as well, body to body to body. Our waters literally make other bodies, and we require other bodies of other waters that in turn require other bodies and other waters to bathe us into being. Human womb, but also pond life, sea monkey, primordial soup, amphibious egg, the moist soil that holds and grows the seed. As themselves milieu for other bodies, all of these bodies proliferate life in the plural. Human bodies ingest reservoir bodies, while reservoir bodies are slaked by rain bodies. Rain bodies absorb ocean bodies. Ocean bodies aspirate fish bodies. Fish bodies are consumed by whale bodies, which then sink to the sea floor to rot and be swallowed up again by the ocean's dark belly. This is a different kind of hydrological cycle. Our bodies are flowing thresholds of waters past and waters to come in relations of gift, theft, exchange, debt. To say that your body is marshland, estuary, ecosystem, that it is riven through with tributaries of companion species nesting in your gut, extending through your fingers, pooling at your feet, is a beautiful way to reimagine one's body. But once we recognize that we are not hermetically sealed in our diver suits of human skin, what do we do with this recognition? What do we owe, and how do we pay? Part two, a measure of the world. In the early 2000s, journalist and mother, Florence Williams, decided to do some research into the human breast milk that she was pumping into her mini-me at regular <laughs> intervals. While the verification of a healthy cocktail of fat, vitamins A, C, E, and K, Lactose, essential minerals, growth hormones, proteins, enzymes, and antibodies was comforting. More alarming were the other substances that showed up on the ingredients. DDT, PCDs, dioxin, trichloroethylene, percolate, mercury, lead, benzene, arsenic, paint thinners, dry cleaning fluids, wood preservatives, toilet deodorizers, cosmetic additives, gasoline byproducts, rocket fuel, termite poisons, fungicides, and flame retardants. All of this downloaded into another small body in biomagnified amounts. As Williams came to realize, even the best neoliberal citizen's suit of protective armor couldn't stop her from walking on carpets, sitting on couches, using her cell phone, or from being surrounded by free-floating flame retardants which do not molecularly bind to anything and thus come to be found in everything from household dust to pork sausage. 
And so eventually, Williams owned mammalian superfood, too. Williams' body and her bodily waters specifically thus become a measure of the rise of industrial chemistry and the triumph of late capitalism, as well as the storehouse for their material remains. But if our bodily waters ebb, they also flow. While Williams was primarily concerned about how her bodily waters were metonymic of a toxic world, I'm also curious about how the idea of one's body of water as environmental sensor might be reversed. That is, how is the whole wet world also a measure of me? Part three, planetary breast milk. Anthropogenically created pollutants such as those in Williams' breast milk travel further still, hitching a ride on atmospheric currents cycling from more temperate regions to the polar north. Many persistent organic pollutants, or POPs, come to settle in the Arctic. Here, thanks to the cold, the toxins don't break down easily and they instead concentrate. They enter the food chain, from plankton to fish to large marine mammals. Sea mammal fat is then consumed as a traditional dietary staple. As a result, the breast milk of Inuit women contains two to ten times the amount of organochlorine concentrations, then do samples from white women hundreds of kilometers to the south. Indeed, at one point in the recent past, the greatest body burden known to occur from environmental exposure was found in Inuit mother's breast milk. Body burden is a biochemical descriptor, but it manifests in multiple ways. It is also a way of naming social, cultural, gender, and species-related inheritances of response and responsibility. While the Arctic is generally considered to be one of the last pristine regions on Earth, its populations still bear the brunt of global human imperialism. This incursion at a distance precipitated by mass fossil fuel burning and toxic consumption, traces new kinds of colonialism and emerging markers of vulnerability, but also survivance. Colonialism is now carried by currents in a weather and water world of planetary circulation, one increasingly made by our own bodies of water. Part four, becoming whale. Within this example of toxic breast milk, a whole slurry of concerns swirl. Biomagnification reminds us not only of the toxic harbor that is our own bodies, but also of our complicity in the transformation of other bodies of water. And importantly, while water itself is a vector of, of contamination, so too are the bodies of non-human animals. It is the thumb-sized piece of muck tuck, this big, or cetacean blubber, eaten by Innu women, after all, that contains the most untenable loads of PCBs. A whale out of water, writes Jacques Cousteau in 1972, even though it is an air breather, dies very quickly. The pioneering oceanographer explains further. He writes, in the ocean air, rather, in the open air, he has not the strength nor the limbs to regain the life-giving water. Great though the whale is, his power is not sufficient to fill his lungs, to move the tons of blubber that cover his body, and on shore he dies of asphyxiation. Or as Sydney-based writer Rebecca Giggs writes in 2015, witnessing the slow death of a stranded humpback on a beach in Western Australia, while in the ocean its blubber fat insulates the whale and allows the animal to maintain a constant inner temperature, out of the ocean, the blubber smothers it. Though we were now shivering, she writes, the whale, only meters away, was boiling alive in the kettle of itself. After watching the humpback's demise, Rebecca Giggs sought out more information about beached whales. And she writes, I learned that in the coastal currents, some whales become entangled in abandoned fishing get, kit or ingest trash, bags, wrappers, mesh, because they are so well insulated by that thick layer of blubber, they attract fat-soluble toxins as well, absorbing heavy metals and inorganic compounds found in pesticides, fertilizers, and other pollutants that powder the modern sea. Levels build up over many seasons, making some animals far more polluted than their surrounding environment. 
Knowing that the whale on the beach was destined for the municipal waste management facility, Giggs says she was moved to think about the whale as landfill. It was a metaphor, she notes, and then it wasn't. The same could be said about the sea as dump. There are many human myths and origin stories of our own emergence from the sea and of our fabled connection to whales and other cetaceans. While most of us know that some billions of years ago, a brave fish developed a backbone and walked out of the water, becoming our earliest terrestrial ancestor, fewer of us know that whales were already land mammals once. But whether chased or pushed or just plain clever, they found their way back to the sea. They still breathe the same air as you and I. When we consider the ways in which cetaceans and our other fishy beginnings echo through our own flesh, watery body to watery body, we might pause and reflect on the ways in which we also echo through them. And these echoes aren't metaphoric. Low frequency active military sonar emits the pressure of 120 decibels, a level that would damage our human ability to hear for 3.9 million kilometers squared in the sea while mid-frequency sonar can emit continuous sound above 235 decibels, which is mostly like a rocket blast off. High-intensity sonar and seismic waves snake along the ocean floor seeking oil and gas deposits. Meanwhile, background noise in the ocean doubles every decade, mostly from commercial shipping traffic. Cetacean deaths sometimes surface as mass strandings, but necropsies show extensive internal bleeding in cranial regions. Perhaps at last we return to those tides in the body, ebbing and flowing, perhaps to that fluid in our inner ear, in the middle of our heads. What other bodies echo there? And what sea changes are we sounding? Thank you. 